I would like to give a warm welcome to all of you. In this video, as well as in the next video, we will establish some ground rules when to exchange pieces and when not to. Weak players often think that each piece they exchange they get closer to a draw, but this is not the case. There are certain situations when you should change a piece and certain situations where you shouldn't. For example, if you have a material advantage, then you should change pieces. The more pieces you change, the closer you get to the end game, the easier it is to convert this material advantage. Of course, if you're down something in material, you should keep a lot of pieces and avoid this worst case end game scenario. Then you should change pieces when you have better structure. Also, you can get there into some better end game, but with better structure, you should change pieces. On the other hand, if you have worse structure, you need to keep as many pieces as possible and play for the dynamic features of the position. Then sometimes you change pieces because you want to highlight one specific criteria of the position. For example, if you have a good knight against a bad bishop, with each piece that you exchange, this good knight will get stronger and this bad bishop will get weaker. If you have the bad bishop, of course, you need to keep as many pieces as possible so that the difference between these two pieces is not that big. And the last criteria is you change a piece to weaken a whole set of squares. For example, you change a fianchetto bishop and then all these squares around this fianchetto will be weak. But it doesn't have to be necessarily a fianchetto bishop. It can be any piece, any piece that is defending a lot of squares and you change this piece then these squares will get weak. And we will see practical examples to all of these scenarios and we start with first one here. It's white move but first let's get into the position see what's going on. White is an exchange up but both kings feel very shaky the position is quite messy and it's not so easy to come up with a decent plan. Because each time white goes for some attack, it will be also black will go for some attack and this exchange difference won't play such a big role. But if we apply the rules that we heard before, white is up in material, so he should strive for peace exchanges. So the first move is quite easy to find. By this rule, it's rook f1, offering the exchange of rooks. Black is avoiding this with rook e7 keeping the rook on the board and now white is threatening to change the next piece. He goes queen g2 with the idea queen d5. The same could be done with queen h1 and queen d5 would be just as good. So let's say queen g2, threat is queen d5, only way to protect against this threat is rook d7. Rook is covering the d5 square. But now white is using a small tactic. He is going queen e4 and the threat is rook f6. And white is threatening to win a piece, so black is defending against this rook f6 move. He goes rook e7 and white finally can change the queens. He goes queen d5, queen takes d5, c d5. Black goes rook d7, now white is using another tactic, he's going d6. This d6 pawn can't be taken because if rook d6 comes, White simply plays bishop c4 check. The knight needs to take on c4 and rook e8 and black is in huge troubles because bishop f8 for example would be made in a few moves like this. So we see that black can't take on d6 so he plays rook d7. Very natural move because white's threat anyway was bishop c4. So with this rook d8 move he's covering bishop c4 since he protected the 8th rank. But white simply plays d7. He renews the threat of bishop c4. Finally, black is forced to take on d7. Bishop c4 comes. Knight c4. Rook e8 check. Only move bishop f8. Rook takes f8. King g7. And after two more checks, White wins another pawn, so if king e6, then he takes the pawn on g6. If king e7, then the simplest will be rook g7, exchanging one more piece and getting a clearly favorable winning endgame. And 
if we compare this position with the one we were starting with, we see that White finally achieved the winning position just by exchanging pieces. He didn't do anything else, he just exchanged pieces. And Black tried to avoid, but he couldn't. So we see that if you have material advantage, you should keep on exchanging as much as possible and convert your advantage to a winning endgame. Let's move on to the next example. And this one we will look from Black's side. First, we need to get into the position to understand what's going on. Black is an exchange up. He's one pawn down for this, but he's also in control of the D file and he has quite a big advantage. Now the E7 pawn is hanging and the question is what to do. Since we know that when you're up in material, you should go for peace exchanges. First move is pretty obvious again, bishop f6. We want to exchange this bishop. White tries to avoid this exchange, he goes bishop g3. And black continues with this exchanging policy, he goes queen b6. Now the white queen cannot really go away because then the p2 pawn will fall. And if white changes on b6, a b6 and tries to hang on this p2 pawn with rook b1, then black can go rook c2 and next move will be rook d2. And it's important to note that bishop d1 is not working for tactical reasons. Rook takes b2 and you can't take back because rook d1 will be made. So if this bishop d1 is not working, then there's no way to stop rook d2. And black achieved completely winning position. He did this again. If we start from the first position we had, we see that black just by threatening to exchange and finally succeeding to exchange, he achieved a winning position. So once again, if you're up in material, you should just try to exchange as many pieces as possible and get to a winning endgame. Let's move on to the next example. This next example is again, we will have a look at, at it from Black's point of view. White played bishop e1 in this position, and now it's Black's turn. We see that Black has a structural advantage. He has three pawns on the queen side against only two of white on the queen side. This a4 pawn can be potentially very weak because it's not easy to protect it. Knight c5 can attack it, and in some endgame, maybe even bishop c2 could come and pick up the pawn on a4. We see that white's kingside majority is not so strong because white can never get the past pawn with these five pawns against four. So we see that black has big structural advantage. And as we learned already in the beginning of this video, the way to exploit this structural advantage is to exchange as many pieces as possible and get to an endgame. So knight c5 is the correct move. And if white would be familiar with the ideas that we were mentioning just now, he should play rook d4 because he needs to keep as many pieces as possible. He is not allowed to exchange because he has the weaker structure. So he should keep his pieces on the board and play rook d4. Later on, he can protect this rook with bishop f2, maybe even go rook d1. And black can't take on d4 because then e d4 would come and white structure is perfectly fine again. So black should play some rook d7 move and he would still be slightly better, but the advantage is not easy to convert because so many pieces are still on the board. But white made quite a serious mistake here and exchanged on d8 himself, which he should not do with this structural disadvantage. So he took on d8, rook d8. And already now he's in a big dilemma because he only has the choice to play rook d1 and exchange even more pieces or to give up the d file altogether. And black could play some move like bishop d3 or knight d3 or in the right moment even queen d7. Just take over the d file. And anyway, white would have to defend passively and would be in a very unpleasant situation, maybe even hopeless. But the rook d1 was not much better because now after rook d1, black succeeds in his goal with rook takes d1, queen d1, followed by queen d7. He's offering the exchange of queens. And again, if white avoids it, 
by moving the queen away from the d-file. Then black is in full control over the d-file, which would be also not a pleasant scenario. Maybe a better one than in the game, where white took on d7, knight takes d7, and for example if king f2, knight c5. Next move will be bishop c2. The pawn on e4 will be weak and will fall. But even if the pawn would not fall directly, this very bad structure would give black decent winning chances. In our current position with this a4 pawn that weak, the position should be already winning. And we see that from the starting position of the bishop e1, just in 5 or 6 moves, black achieved the winning position by barely exchanging pieces. He didn't do anything else but exchange pieces. He went knight c5 and traded all the heavy pieces on the d-file and got the winning position. So we see with structural advantage, you keep on changing pieces, you go into a better endgame. And white was not familiar with this concept, he should go rook d4, keep as many pieces as possible on the board, and he would have a very defensible position. Let's move on to the next example. And in this example, it's white's move, but we will anyway keep a look at it from black side. Which move should white play? We see that white has a worse structure, because white has one pawn island more. So he has this a pawn, then this cd, and then fgh. Well, black on the other side only has two pawn islands. And in particular, these pawns on c3 and d4, they could be quite weak. They are on half open files, and black, for example, in the next few moves, he would go bishop a6, develop the knight from b8 somewhere, and then get the rook to c8 and one rook to d8. He will make pressure on both of these pawns, and white would be anyway slightly worse. But in the game, white made a serious inaccuracy. He went queen b4. As we mentioned before, if you have structural disadvantage, you should not exchange pieces. So queen b4 is violating this rule. And okay, black could take on b4 and probably still be slightly better, but he has even a stronger move. He can go knight c6, which brings us to another very important point when talking about exchanges. There's the saying that the weaker player exchanges and the stronger player is letting him exchange. And there is some truth in this, because if you let your opponent to exchange, like here, for example, queen a5, knight a5, we see a big difference. Instead of the knight being on b8, the knight moved to a5, the very active position. So basically, by letting the opponent exchange, black got two extra moves. So whenever you have the choice between changing yourself or let your opponent change, then always let the opponent change and take the extra moves. Of course, after knight c6, maybe the best move for white would be anyway queen b2, but he should play some move like queen b2 or bishop e2 already in the starting position. No need to waste a move with queen b4. And to see that after queen b4, knight c6, queen a5, knight a5, that white is already in big trouble because he went to an endgame. We can see a few more moves of the game. In the game, white played knight e5, bishop e7, c4 was played, rook c8. Black is sticking to his plan. He puts his rooks on the half-open files and will make pressure on d and c pawns. Like rook b1, rook fd8, f3, and he plays bishop a6, attacks one more time c4, and he's planning to go knight e8, maybe f6, and knight d6, attacking c4 way too often that white could defend, and black is very close to a winning position. So we make a short recap. In this video we saw that if you have material advantage or structural advantage, you should strive to exchange pieces. You should go to endgames, yeah? you should exchange as many pieces as possible. While if you have material disadvantage or structural disadvantage, you need to keep your dynamic options. And to keep your dynamic options, you need to keep as many pieces as possible. I wish you a lot of fun and a lot of success employing these techniques in your own games, and see you in the next video.